Seventh Day Adventism was founded in Michigan in 1863. Some key figures were Ellen G. White, James White, and Joseph Bates. Seventh Day Adventism has an emphasis on Christ's second coming, observing the Saturday Sabbath, and health principles. Welcome back to the Church History Podcast. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. Last week, I released my second book, The Church is Corrupted. Did you ever wonder how the church went from its founding on Pentecost to the corrupted institution that ultimately needed a reformation? Well, my book, The Church is Corrupted, takes you on a journey through history. It shows you how the church gradually strayed, but it also talks about the faithful people of God who stood firm on their beliefs, even in the dark times. You can discover how corruption crept in, and you can meet the heroes who fought to keep the truth alive. Here's a short ad for the book. My new book, The Church is Corrupt, is available for order. I previously published the book, The Church is Born, which was part one in our series, and that delved into the creation of the church. But my second book picks up where the first one left off. It offers a unique and insightful perspective on the church's journey. Discover the rich history of the church, its triumphs, its failures, and its heroes. In this second book in the series on church history, we journey through the pivotal moments that shaped Christianity as we know it. From the foundational theology of the early church to the inspiring lives of great men and women who boldly stood for their faith. Explore the church's role during the Crusades, the Inquisitions, and even the discovery of America. Learn how over centuries, the church began to slowly lose its way, setting the stage for the momental changes just before the Protestant Reformation. With each chapter highlighting a different story, you're going to be inspired by the heroes of our faith and challenged to reflect on the lessons from the church's successes and its stumbles. Whether you're a seasoned historian or just beginning your exploration of church history, this book offers valuable insights for everyone. Both books, The Church is Born and The Church is Compromised, are available on Amazon for you to order. So if you haven't gotten the first book, why not get both today and delve into the comprehensive understanding of the church's journey? So thank you to everyone that ordered the book, and I hope that you're enjoying it. Let's get started on today's episode. This podcast tells a story of the church in chronological order. This season, we're discussing different denominations, religions, and belief systems that affected the church in the late 1800s and early 1900s. We've discussed the founding of Mormons, the rise of atheism, and the public school movement that was founded on socialism and communism. And today, we're delving into the start of the Seventh-day Advent Church. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to remind you one more time that my book, The Church is Corrupted, came out last week. Don't forget to order it. Imagine a time when people across the United States felt a renewed energy to read the Bible, attend church, and talk about God. This time in history is known as the Second Great Awakening, and it changed how people thought about faith, religion, and even community. Starting in the early 1800s, this movement spread through the country, especially in towns and cities along the American frontier. People gathered in huge crowds for outdoor church meetings that they called revivals. These gatherings weren't your typical church service, They were lively and filled with songs, and everyone was excited to hear powerful preachers talk about God and the importance of faith. One of the biggest ideas of the Second Great Awakening was that the Bible should be available to everyone. There was a huge push to print and to publish Bibles. That made them affordable and accessible even for people with little money. Printing presses across the country worked day and night to produce copies, and people from all walks of life, started reading the Bible independently or even with family and friends. Reading the Bible for themselves, people found passages that spoke about the return of Jesus Christ, and excitement began to build around the idea of His second coming. As they read and learned, people wanted to be ready for that moment. 
and they encouraged others to prepare as well. During this time, churches saw their memberships grow rapidly. Congregational, Presbyterian, Baptist, and Methodist churches in particular experienced big increases in attendance and participation. People who hadn't been involved in church for a long time or ever started coming, and it felt like a fire had ignited nationwide. And this sparked a spiritual revival, and it united people. The Second Great Awakening also made people aware about issues around them. As they gathered for revivals and focused on Jesus' teaching, they began thinking about how they could improve society. The movement led many involved in cases like abolishing slavery, improving education, and caring for the poor and the sick. The impact of this spiritual revival would ripple through American society for decades to come. It changed personal lives, but also it changed whole communities. The Second Great Awakening came shortly after the French Revolution. And learning about the French Revolution and the things that had happened in France affected the church, and many people believed this was a sign that Jesus was going to return soon. Here are some of the things that happened, and if you want to learn more about the French Revolution, I'll put a link in the show notes to some of the episodes I covered on the French Revolution in the past. As the French Revolution swept across France, it shook the world in ways that made people wonder if the end of the time was actually here. It was a time of deep uncertainty, not only for the French people, but for people worldwide, especially people who were strong Christians. The revolution began in 1789, and it saw intense violence and the execution of many people, including Louis XVI, the King of France, who was put to death by guillotine on January 21, 1793. Pope Pius VI was a firm person who stood against the revolution, and he mourned the king's death, and even publicly called him a martyr of the faith. One of the most shocking events of the French Revolution happened in 1798, when the French general Louis-Alexandre Barthier marched into Rome. He declared that the Pope was no longer the ruler of Rome. He demanded that the people submit to the Roman Republic. Pope Pius VI, who was a devoted and one of the longest-serving popes, refused to give up his authority, and for his defiance, he was arrested and taken away by French forces. Just six weeks later, Pope Pius VI died in captivity. This left many believers in shock, as it felt like a powerful symbol that they were at the end of the ages. Many Christians in France suffered and faced the threat of guillotine, and as the fear spread, interest in Bible prophecy began to grow. People searched scriptures for signs of the end times. They were looking for hope, for answers, and for comfort. Many French families, seeking religious freedom and a new life, moved across the Atlantic to North America, where they hoped to escape persecution they faced in France. During that time, in Canada, the British authorities were worried that these revolutionary ideas might spread to Canada, especially with so many new arrivals from France. So in order to maintain control and stability, they introduced the Constitutional Act of 1791, which divided the province of Quebec into two parts, Upper Canada, which is now called Ontario, and Lower Canada, which is now called Quebec. This division allowed the British to maintain the two regions separately and kept a close eye on any revolutionary influences from these French newcomers. So that is a very long introduction, but I want you to get a sense of what was happening in the world during this time between the Second Great Awakening, the fears and all of the things that people were hearing in North America from the French Revolution, people believed, truly believed, that Jesus was going to return at any moment. And it was during all of this that our story starts. In 1831, a small Baptist church welcomed a preacher named William Miller. He was a man with kind of a fascinating journey in his faith. For many, many years, William had been a deist. Deists believe that God exists, but doesn't interfere in the world. 
Deus, think of God as a clockmaker. He created the universe, set it in motion, and then let it run independently. Deists believe God is distant, uninvolved, and doesn't perform miracles or answer prayers. One of the best-known deists in American history is Thomas Jefferson. He often wrote about God using the term providence because he didn't believe in a personal God. However, when Bibles became more open for everyone to have, William's outlook changed because he began to study and read the Bible for himself. He eventually left the idea of deism and became a Baptist. During this time, he became a lay leader in a Baptist community and he began preaching a powerful message based on the book of Daniel, chapter 8. William's sermon was called The Second Advent of Jesus and he claimed that Jesus was going to return to earth between March 1843 and March 1844. His message gave people hope, and the people following him became known as Millerites. William Miller's prediction grew in popularity, and as 1844 approached, the date of Jesus' return was narrowed down to specifically October 22nd. The Millerites waited eagerly for that day. They called it their blessed hope, a time they believed was going to bring joy, peace, and fulfillment of God's promise. But when October 22nd arrived, nothing extraordinary happened. There was no sign of Jesus returning, and the Millerites were left devastated. The day became known as the Great Disappointment. Many followers were left heartbroken, confused, and wondering what had gone wrong. After the Great Disappointment, Miller's movement basically fell apart. Most followers stopped believing that Jesus was going to return. Some thought Miller simply had the wrong date. However, there was a third group, a few, who believed the date itself was correct, but they had misunderstood what would happen. This smaller group formed what we know today as the Seventh-day Advent Church. This outcome deeply saddened William Miller. He stepped away from leadership roles and spent his final years in quiet and passed away in 1849. On that night of October 22, 1844, Hiram Edison and other Millites experienced one of their deepest disappointments. Hiram Edison had spent months believing Jesus would return on that very day, but as the hours passed, his hopes dimmed and the reality set in. Nothing had happened. Edison wrote about that night, saying this, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawn. The next morning, Edison, who lived in Port Gibson, New York, was walking through the grain field with a friend. And as they walked, Edison suddenly stopped and saw a vision. He later wrote this about his vision. Heaven seemed opened to my view, and I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the Most High of the Heavenly Sanctuary to come to this earth, he, for the first time, entered the second apartment of that sanctuary, and he had a work to perform in the Most Holy before coming to earth. Edison felt a wave of hope and purpose he realized that perhaps they hadn't been wrong about the time. They'd been wrong about the event itself. Edison believed that Jesus, as the high priest, had entered the most holy place in heaven to begin a new work, instead of coming to earth as they had expected. This vision encouraged others as Edison began sharing it with other believers. He had two friends, O.R.L. Crozier and Franklin B. Hahn. He began studying the Bible more closely to understand their experience. They read the parable of the ten virgins in the Bible, and they used it to explain why the bridegroom, Jesus, had delayed his return. Their findings were published in a paper called Day Dawn, and this encouraged many disappointed people, and more people joined the group. Hiram Edson's vision and the paper they published helped pave the way for the formation of the Seventh-day Advent Church, which teaches 
that Jesus began a new phase of his ministry in 1844 and continues to prepare for his eventual return. This interpretation gave the Millerites a new perspective and hope and transformed their great disappointment into a renewed commitment of faith. Among these people of Millerites who had a new hope was a man named William Farnsworth, who began to pay more attention to an idea that a woman in his church had shared. The woman's name was Rachel Preston. Rachel believed that the true day of worship was Saturday and not Sunday. Now, the pastor hadn't really listened to her or focused on what she had to say for a while because he believed the end of the world was near. However, after the great disappointment, William Farnsworth and others in the congregation began to consider more closely Rachel's teachings and take them more seriously. In the spring of 1844, William Farnsworth Church decided to meet on Saturdays, and this marked the beginning of what would later be called the Sabbath Movement. This idea began to spread even more when T. M. Purble, who was influenced by Rachel and William, wrote an article for the Hope of Israel. It was published on February 28, 1845. And in that article, he explained he believed Saturday was a proper day for worship. He then printed the article as a tract so he could share his belief more widely. One of the people who read that article and that tract was named Joseph Bates, and he was eager to meet with other people who shared this belief. So he organized a gathering at his farm in 1846, and on that day, a lot of like-minded believers came to discuss the Sabbath and their shared commitment to worshiping on Saturdays. At this meeting, they decided to start their very own congregation, and they would honor the Sabbath on Saturdays. Over the next few years, from April 1848 all the way until December 1850, 22 different Sabbath conferences were held across New York and New England. These gatherings allowed leaders like James White, Joseph Bates, Stephen Pierce, and Hiram Edson to discuss their beliefs, and eventually they formed a clear understanding of these new doctrines. At first, the group believed the Sabbath began at 6 p.m. on Friday, but by 1855, it was more widely agreed that the Sabbath would begin at sunset at Friday evening. Ellen White and her husband James and Joseph Bates became basically the central figures that shaped and led this movement. They wanted to encourage believers and provide a clearer interpretation of the investigative judgment. They taught that since 1844, Jesus was performing a heavenly judgment. He was reviewing the lives of the dead and the living. This judgment, they believed, would determine the fate of souls, and Jesus' second coming would happen as soon as he was finished his heavenly judgment. During this time with Ellen White, her husband James, and Joseph Bates in leadership, the church began to grow and became more organized. In May 1863, the movement was officially incorporated and officially became the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this was a new denomination. It held firmly to the belief that Jesus was actively preparing the way for his return through his judgment process. The investigative judgment doctrine became the central part of their teaching. And this set them apart from the other Christian groups, and it inspired them to emphasize preparation, health, and being vigilant. In 1874, about eight years after they officially became a church, they began their mission movement. Their first official missionary was J.N. Andrews, and he was missionary to Switzerland. Back in the United States, Ellen White, who was the central figure in the community, continued to help the church grow. She and her family settled in Michigan, which became the hub for the church. From there, she made regular trips to California to support other churches and help establish institutions. They also expanded missionary efforts. They traveled to Europe, England, Germany, France, Italy, Denmark, Norway, and even Sweden. They offered support and guidance to missionaries and encouraged believers. They even traveled as far as Australia. Ellen White remained a powerful influence in the Seventh-day Adventist Church throughout her life. 
She claimed to receive visions from God. These guided her writings and her teachings. She produced over 5,000 magazine articles and wrote over 40 books. One of the things that Ellen White really emphasized was health and spirituality. And because of that, many of the missionaries created hospitals and clinics in the countries where they went. Health became a core part of the Seventh-day Adventist life, along with education. The church founded many schools and colleges. What began as a small movement has now grown into international church with over 19 million members, and it is in over 200 countries. And actually less than 10% of its members live in the United States. So let's quickly break down what the beliefs are. The Seventh-day Adventist Church shares many core beliefs with mainstream Christianity, but it has several areas that set them apart. First, of course, is a Sabbath observance. Seventh-day Adventists worship on Saturday, which they see as a biblical Sabbath. This is different than most Christian denominations who worship on Sunday. They also believe in soul sleep and judgment. They believe that upon death, souls do not immediately go to heaven or hell. Instead, they enter a soul sleep where they remain unconscious until the resurrection and the final judgment. Connected to this teaching is the teaching of the investigative judgment, which they believe started in 1844. On that day, the blessed hope, Jesus began to review the lives of the dead and the living to determine who would be saved when the final judgment occurred. They also believe in communion and foot washing. The communion service includes foot washing as a symbol of humility, inner cleaning, and service. This service is open to all Christians and is typically celebrated four times a year, beginning with men and women washing each other's feet in separate rooms before sharing unleavened bread and grape juice. Health and lifestyle is also emphasized as they believe the body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Many are vegetarians, avoid alcohol, tobacco, or any kind of drugs. They see these choices as a way to honor God. The Seventh-day Adventists do hold several traditional Christian beliefs. They believe in salvation and Jesus Christ. They believe Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, became human, died for humanity's sins, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And only through accepting Christ's atoning death are you saved for eternity. They believe in the Trinity. They believe in one God who composes three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They also believe in the Bible. They hold the Bible as divinely inspired and infallible. They hold a premillennial eschatology. They believe in a literal 1,000-year period following Christ's second coming. And that is the story of the founding of the Seventh-day Adventists. We have two more episodes in this season. We're going to talk next week about the rise of spiritualism and the week after that on the founding of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then we'll start our Christmas season. Actually, this week I'm putting up our Christmas decorations and I'm really excited because this is my favorite time of year. And I'll probably post some pictures on my Instagram account if you want to see them. In the meantime, don't forget to order my two books, The Church is Born and the church is corrupted. Today is November 11th, and here in Canada, we have Remembrance Day. So I'm going to end this episode. I want to thank the soldiers who fought, who died, who gave us so much so we could live in freedom. And I don't take that freedom for granted. And I pray God will always keep our land glorious and free. (laughs) 